Oh, happy holidays, everybody! Whoa! This is Kofo Live and Undead. I am your host, Daniel Crozier, and I am joined by Sean Renner and Chalista. Wow! <laughs> Oh, you can't hear me. That was such an incredible introduction that we didn't get any preparation for. You just like threw it right at us and I'm speechless. It was incredible. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I don't either. Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, clearly I like to get uh, pretty sloshy with you know, uh, uh, on that intro and stuff. But uh, yeah, guys, thanks for, for joining me. This is the, the last show of uh, 2022. Oh, wow. The season wow. finale. This is the season finale. We're hit, we're ending on a high note. So yeah, terrible. I know terrible puns. I'm just <laughs> terrible of just bad dad jokes. That's all I'm chock full of is just you know stuff like that. But you know, yeah, I, I wanted to you know bring you guys in. Your uh, you did uh, you scored a, a, a movie together called Screwdriver. And I can't wait to, to get into it and, and, and chat a little bit about that. But if you wouldn't mind, you know, tell us a little bit about yourselves um, and you know, how you got into scoring film. Sean, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, gosh, OK, well, let's see. I, I started playing music when I was a kid. I always loved music. I played piano growing up. Um, and, but for whatever reason, I never really thought about doing it as a career, I think because I had never tried writing music of my own. Um, and I also loved film. So I actually went to film school for my undergraduate degree. And when I was in film school was when I started writing my own music and <clears throat> learned how to use the recording studios there. I worked in the recording studios. And when I started recording music and writing it, I just totally fell in love with it. So that's where I got started scoring films was when I was in film school. Um, after I graduated, I, I, I was really into my solo music for, so for a, a long time, for like seven or eight years, I was just really focused on my solo music as an independent musician, recording and touring and stuff like that and doing the odd film score here and there. And I think it was around 2013 ish that I really decided, you know, I think I want to shift things and I really want to focus more on doing the film scoring thing as a career. So I moved out to Los Angeles. Uh, I went back to school to study more things for film scoring. I, um, I went to CalArts here in Los Angeles and I did a master's program um, where I got to learn about writing for the orchestra. I got to study film scoring and just moving out here, doing that program. That's where things really took off for me. You know, just being in, in Los Angeles, so many opportunities. Now, you know, I was able to start doing some work for and with other composers and you know meeting directors and that was in 2016 that i made that move here and so yeah this has really been my my full-time thing uh for the last four ish four or five years now wow that's that's awesome uh yeah chalista you and i go back a few years you know uh mm -hmm. yeah three or four 15 uh you know but uh uh, I, I've always known you to be uh, yeah, an amazing uh, cellist. And uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your, your background and how you uh, you met up with, with Sean to, to work on this uh, film, Screwdriver? Yeah, so I'm really, I mean, I feel really lucky that I got to meet Sean and that he invited me to perform his music that he wrote for Screwdriver. Um, 
So Sean, I know you through my childhood best friend, Maria, who I've known since age 11 and she was yes. friends with your wife. And I think that Maria, she was the connection for us. And, um, when did you, so Sean had been on tour with me for a few mm -hmm. dates for my tour for transfigurations in 2019. Um, and so we got to kind of do music that way. And then I moved to Los Angeles in the middle of the pandemic, found myself a rent control department by the beach in Santa Monica. And um, Sean reached out at some point saying, I have a film, it needs some cello. And we began the process of recording and we recorded all of my parts at, um, virtually and I was at my home in Santa Monica. So it was a really cool, very interesting recording experience because I laid down all those tracks and it was so cool to go to the screening and hear everything as a collective whole, all mixed and, and all of that. It was an incredible experience. Yeah, I think that was, uh, as you're saying that, it was like really like right after the pandemic had started. And I it was like at this time that a lot of people were doing remote recording like that and all sort of like figuring it out together you know because um we did we had a you know having to do that remote recording with um, it was wonderful to have chalista and i also had a couple other um the people that i know and they were in different locations so we did these remote sessions independently and then had to figure out how to mix it all together <laughs> um, and then i remember at a time like reading an article i can't remember what it was for a tv series or uh, I can't remember what it was. There was a show that had just come out and the composer was this whole thing about how he was like, gosh, it's so crazy to record in different places and figure out how to. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what we were yeah. figuring out together. You know, <laughs> it was incredible because we were you had us using Ableton as our our platform, essentially. And yes. we did several sessions, I think. Oh, yeah, what is what is Ableton? Is that just like a like a Zoom platform, or is just or is that? Uh, like it's a DAW. It's a digital audio workstation. So there's a few kind of big recording production, music production platforms that people use um, right. for for music production in general or for film scoring. Um, Ableton, it, I, I love Ableton. I've used it for live performance for a long time, and that's a really important part of my music production process. Okay, it's cool. it's not. Uh, it's not one that a lot of film folks use. And I use, I use a couple other pieces of software in conjunction with that. But whenever I'm doing working with live audio, I like to use Ableton at some point because of the ability that it gives you to manipulate the audio and process it in interesting ways, which was a part of the music for that film. So it, it made sense for us to, it was something that, that, that Chalista's used and had and is familiar with. So it made a lot of sense let's just do it in that and it'll give us a lot of options. Yeah. Cause we did have a lot of options. I think we did quite a few takes of everything. Um, it was, it was a really, for me, it was a really fun process just because at that point Ableton was new to me. And then I was able to see like the power of that and, and not just like at home, but just, I was thinking right. in terms of live performance as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. Uh, you know, for the film project, uh, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about what that is? What What is Screwdriver? What is that about? So Screwdriver is a film by uh, Cairo Smith. He wrote and directed the film. Um, it's uh, He was able, to, he got really lucky. He shot it and finished shooting it right before the pandemic uh hit so his timing was really great um but it's it's basically it's a film about this uh about a woman who uh whose husband leaves her and she comes to los angeles to stay with an old childhood friend and his wife they sort of take her in to take care of her in the midst of this separation and uh and i don't want to say too much about it you know yes. I don't want to give it away, but um, but yeah, basically the film centers on her being there with them and, you know, they appear very welcoming, but soon it starts to kind of unfold that they have these uh, these ulterior motives for for her um, and things get a little twisted uh, as the film goes on but it all takes place in the house with those three characters so it's really a this kind of character piece kind of yeah. a psycho psychological dark comedy at times it's a really it's a really fun film 
Yeah, it's uh, I, I did uh, you know get a chance to to watch it. You know, uh, you sent me a, a link, and uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of subtext. It's it's an interesting little microcosm, uh, you know, of a film. Yeah, uh, you know, just seeing there yeah, at times, I'm you know, as a viewer, I'm like watching this, and it's like, oh, this is very uh, uh, claustrophobic, you know, in the sense because it all takes place in this house between these three, you know, these three individuals. And, uh, yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, I won't give anything away, but, uh, but there's just, you know, some, some notes of other things going on between, you know, the, these, this, these three, uh, individuals. I'm just like, oh man, yeah, this, this is really, you know, dark, fun stuff, but, you know, can also be an interesting, like social commentary on so many different things going on that you hear about in, in society. Yeah. And, and I, I, I did find that, you know, because there's so many stuff that just kind of hinted at and left unsaid, uh, my imagination just kind of, you know, you know, filled in so many parts. And it's just like, wow, this it's, it's, you know, really good. Um, you know, when you look at a film like this, yeah, you know, how do you uh, decide, you know, what, you know, the sounds are, are going to be, what the music's going to be, you know, and how to get that, you know, kind of support, you know, the, the story that's going on in front of you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's really one of my favorite parts of the process is figuring out the sound world. Um, yeah. And Chalista, you should speak to this too. Um, but for me, at least, I'm like, you know, I love just deciding what our instrumentation is going to be because i'm i don't know i'm not a person that defaults to anything you know it's like i'm not i'm never thinking okay it's a horror film so right. let's get some scary string textures let's get some you know these weird sounds or whatever maybe we're not going to use strings at all you know yeah. i love to work in constraints and i like to choose instruments that make yeah. sense for the story and the sound world yeah because i really just see the film scoring as as part of the world building process, you know, so I like the instruments to make sense for what the themes of the film are and, and the world that it takes place in. Um, all that being said, strings were a huge part of <laughs> this film. Um, you know, so those decisions aren't made in a vacuum, right? It's like, well, um, I love to read it and just come up with some creative ideas for what I think would make sense for this, this sound world. But then, you know, obviously the other part of that is conversations with the, the director about what their visions are for the sound. Um, and, and at least for me and my process, a lot of sometimes that, that comes from, well, these are some film scores that I like that have the same kind of a vibe or same, same kind of emotional feel. So yeah. let's listen to some reference things. And, and often it's sort of a meeting in the middle of what maybe my creative ideas are and maybe some, you know, references or ideas that, that the director might have. And we find a place mm -hmm. to kind of meet in the middle. That's sort of how it goes for me. Chalisa, I'm not sure what your process is like for that. Yeah, it's funny. I think I've been kind of uh, lucky. I don't know what um, the films I have worked on where I'm composing for them they oddly had been using my music as placeholder music. Ooh, and okay. then someone was like, you know, you could call her and just <laughs> have her compose for the film. And so I've had that more often, but like to allude back to what Sean was saying, there's this sort of idea for me of watching the film and creating its sonic aura, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Or like, like Sean was saying, it's like world building. So you're just yeah. creating these, like the essence of this film within sound. And for me, I always kind of compose a little bit thematically anyway. So if I'm yeah. working on a documentary short, like I just had one come out, um, I'll like watch the film over and over and over. And maybe like there was an instance where a character said something and it was sort of rhythmic and I just kind of mm -hmm. took that yeah. rhythm and that became a theme. Um, cool. but I've done other things for just sort of for higher works, um, yes. where I'm just writing little musical cues for reality TV shows, oh, okay. and, you know, 
there's limited creativity in that, but you'll often get for me, at least I don't know Sean's experience, but mm -hmm. I'll get like a, a contract that says we're looking for uh, attention build or suspense, mm -hmm. or can you do that tremolo thing or, <laughs> 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 and so um, I've done a few cues for like the real murders of orange County. Um, okay, cool. nice. so, you know, uh, those I remember just getting the, the wording was like, two people at a table having an intense discussion. So, mm -hmm. you know, it'll go like that. Yeah. The, yes. Something uh, like that, especially over eggs, Benedict, you know, it, it doesn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's such an ideal situation where that, yeah. that she's talking about where they um, use your music as the temp mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. um, right that's a really that's a really nice place to be when you either get that situation or you get a blank slate you know where they say we just want to hear your ideas because right. it's it is it is common in a lot of film scoring for there to be a temp track with with mm -hmm. soundtrack there from other films that they like that's that's literally like they edited to that because they wanted something to edit to right. um and that that can be kind of a controversial thing some people love temp music and some some composers love temp music and some composers hate temp music, you know. Right. Um, and I feel like I fall somewhere kind of in between. I mean, I think, you know, it can be a really great communication tool because, exactly. you know, it's it's very hard to, to articulate with words what you want the music to do. It's much easier to right. say, listen to this. Yeah. And whatever, you know, what that's doing, can you do what that's doing, but in our own way, you know? Right. Um, I love it, Screwdriver, though, because I hear your voice so clearly in that, Sean. Oh, like, thanks. It's just so it's you. And I love that it's retained all of you within it, or it felt like it to me. I don't know how you felt while you were composing, if you felt like you had to sort of adjust or. I appreciate that a lot. I mean, it was a really, it was a very like intense creative project because the music is very, you know, we're, I guess we're talking to folks who haven't seen the film, obviously heard the music. Right. So right. it's, it's very, it has a very classical kind of a feel, you know, the idea with the score is that this couple, this home that she's in with this couple is this pristine LA town home. And <laughs> The, the theme with the film is that, you know, things aren't exactly what they seem. Everything looks beautiful and perfect and LA yeah. and modern and, and the things sort of digress. So the idea with the music was let's do the same thing with the music. So it has this very classical feel, this classical, it's all sort of acoustic um, orchestral mm -hmm. instrumentation, kind of a small group of orchestral in instrumentation that starts off very sort of classical and sort of proper feeling and does the same thing. It sort of devolves, you know, um, there were a lot of kind of things that we did to get that sort of a feel. Um, but, but, you know, to get that kind of a classical feel is, you know, yeah. it was sort of technically that's a lot of, that's a lot of work to, to replicate that sort of a thing. Oh my gosh. You should talk about the instrumentation. I'm sure there are people would love to know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Where, between the two of you, was it just uh, the, the two of you working on uh, the instrumentation or did you bring in other musicians as well? Yeah. So there were a couple other. Um, so we had so the instrumentation is, is basically like a small string ensemble mm -hmm. and then uh, some small woodwind. I actually really just used a, mm -hmm. um, a basset horn, which is like a, a little bit lower than like a clarinet, but lot, not okay. as low as a bass clarinet. Okay. Um, and then there's some piano and marimba and then a few just sort of like drums. So it's kind of like a small chamber ensemble. Yeah. Um, but the idea was, well, you know, let's take that instrumentation, but then because what's happening in the story is that things are getting sort of warped. Her reality is kind of getting warped. Our idea of these people is getting sort of warped. Let's warp the, the instrumentation in the same way where let's like yeah. pro process it in a strange way. Mm -hmm. So it's still all acoustic instrumentation. There's no synthesizers or anything like that, but, it, the, but you know, through like pitch shifting and stretching and kind of things like that, we're able to create this sort of warped version of that instrumentation that kind of lives behind it. So what we did for the, for the strings is um, Chalista um, 
did did the cello work and i had another friend james who did the bass work and another friend nigel who who did the violin work cool. and we did two sessions so the first session that we did was just to create some texture beds so we just came up with like a list of here's there's a bunch of like texture ideas that we can do let's play this note and let's play it this way you know let's play that note this way this way this way this way now let's do another note. Let's play it all these different ways. And we created this, basically this kind of library of textures. Yeah, a palette, right? A That's palette awesome. of textures that then then yeah. I could use to, to write with those textures mm. and write the music. And then for our second session, we did more of what's like a traditional session where after everything had been written and we had some melodies and things like that to play, then we, you know, we played those melodies um, and more of like a, what a traditional film yeah. scoring session would be. But the reason that I wanted to work with somebody like Chalista is because coming up with all these interesting, you know, textures and things like that, you know, having known her and seen her work, she's the first person I thought of to, for mm -hmm. let's get weird with cello sounds. You know? <laughs> <Yes. I assume. laughs> That's good. Well, you know, it was very interesting for me, um, we did all the recording and I didn't see the film until the screening. So yeah. it was really, um, ex it was exciting. It was just very yes. exciting to hear everything mixed and every all the ideas you told me, all the scenes you told me about, because you, you always gave context for every scene. Mm -hmm. So that was really, that was really something. It was really lovely to be sitting with everyone and like, you know, have it come together. Yeah, it was a great screening. It was really, it, there was a lot of folks there, people that I met for the first time that we got to meet for the first time. And um, yeah, it was great. And then, and uh, so we, we had like a, just a premiere for the cast and crew. And then the cool. fi film had its actual premiere at the um, Dances with Films Festival here in Los Angeles. Nice. And when was that? Uh, it was in June. Okay. I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's been a few months. It's been a few months. And then recently it screened in New York at the Soho Film Festival. Nice. And I and I believe that there, you know, I believe hopefully we will see uh, a release uh, soon somewhere. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So for the last six months, it's been making the, the film festival circuit. Yeah. And, and yeah, it has it, uh, it sounds like, you know, working towards getting distribution. Um, yeah. Or... Yeah. I think as with many independent films that yeah. the film festival circuit is a really important way to get visibility and, right. uh, and help with that distribution process. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's still, you know, yeah, six months ish into that process. So still a little ways to go before we, right. we, we hear what's going to happen with it, but yeah. Nice. That's cool. So, so basically, uh, you know, folks yeah, out there that's watching this, if you're interested in seeing screwdriver and damn it, you are, uh, <laughs> you know, you're going to go, you're going to have to go and hunt down the film festival circuit, but you know, hopefully within the next few months, uh, you guys will have an announcement on, on distribution and, and, uh, be able to see it a little bit sooner. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's cool. The, uh, you know, one of the, the key things with with music and scores is it it's it's a wonderful um, you know, uh, storytelling tool for film. It's it's something that can be delivered instantaneous, probably quicker than any frame of film or sequence. You know, can really unveil. But it sets the mood, sets the tone. You know, it's it can foreshadow things. You know, without saying a word. Um, you know, how, how important is it, you know, for you when you sit down, you know, not, not just working on your own stuff, but as a fan, you know, you know, watching a, a film that, uh, you know, that you're, you're moved and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, transcended, you know, with the music in, in the, the film, uh, is it, does it, is that something you always gravitate towards or you notice first and foremost? Um, Sorry, I'm long winded. No, no, it's good. I was just thinking that since moving to LA and doing, doing this, um, I'm now hypersensitive to music and movies and in TV. And I'm hyper aware of like 
mm. poor mixing or <laughs> right, right. I, can't, I feel like I can hear everything and it's really ruined like my reality TV love affair. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yeah, since I was a kid, you know, the person that comes to mind when you talk about this, there's a couple of directors, but like Kubrick, because yeah. like all of the classical stuff. And when I was young, you know, I was starting to play cello and I never thought of classical music in different contexts. I was always thinking within a, a concert hall. And I could say, I think film maybe got me thinking like, hey, it can happen in other worlds, right? Yeah. Um, and then also just like David Lynch and his use of yes. music, just his placement of music, not even like who he uses for compositions or whatnot, but also just how he curates. I think that's yeah. something I became very aware of, like that can really control the flow of a piece of visual art, of mm -hmm. a moving picture. Yeah, I think that's right on. I mean, I think one of the things that I learned real quickly when I started doing this uh, is that just as important as what the music is, yeah. is where you choose to use music at all. Yeah. And that's why I I love it when I get the opportunity to not have temp music. And even if there is temp music there, like either way, in every for every project that I do, I say, I'm going to do a pass like on my own. I'm going to totally ignore the temp music because yeah. I just want to see what happens. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I always think it's really interesting to just try and wait as long as I can yeah. to bring the thing in, you know, to see, yeah. to God, see what happens. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. I love it. Like in, in, in contrast to that, I was just re re thinking that we just watched this film. My wife and I watched uh, Ambulance, the, the Michael Bay film right, right, right. With, right. with Jake Gyllenhaal. And uh, you know, Lauren Balfe did the music and he's, he's incredibly talented. He's, he's fantastic. But it was interesting to note that there's music everywhere in that film uh -huh. just like end to end music yeah. which is I, you know i was like it's a michael bay film and michael bay is gonna be stacked it's gonna be stacked right but that's that's yeah. what he does and he's brilliant yeah. at it it's it's intense like all the way through you know right. um another film that comes to mind like that that i love is uh uh good time um all right okay that With film yeah, James uh, Pattinson, right? Yes, Robert Pattinson. Robert Pattinson. Yeah, I love yeah, that James film. James Pattinson's the the writer. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> um, the guy who did that music, One O Tricks Point Never. He also did the the music for their their other most recent film with Adam Sandler, okay. Uncut oh, Gems. Yeah. And yeah. that movie was both of those movies are the same way. I mean, he he does this electronic music, and it's just yeah. like like with Good Time, it was like just on the whole film but just go 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 and it was so right. intense and it works so yeah. well you know yeah but that's, yeah that, yeah that that's one thing i got from uncut gems was the uh you know the anxiety is the, the the music you know not only the story and everything but the music really set the pace and really made me you know hyper you know anxiety ridden and uh, so great great film i mean one great of film. the best movies of that year i think it just came out like what two years ago yeah uh, i think that's ago. right um but uh but I, I remember it's it's one of those uh scores and the pacing and everything mm -hmm. that i had to er, i think every 20 minutes i had to get up pause <laughs> it go do something else for a couple hours and then come back to it yeah it's, but but that's the point, you know. It's I, I think uh, not all great films need to be something that you you love and enjoy, you know. You know on on just like this, you know, more uh, standard emotions, but also understand that a good film can give you anxiety, can yeah. really you know uh, make you uncomfortable and stuff. And it's like, oh man, yeah, it's and there. And the interesting thing about that too is like that that music works so well with that to do that that way. But you can also have a film that has no music that does the exact right. same thing. Okay. Right. Um, what was it? Oh, I watched this film, uh, Dragged Across Concrete, Concrete, with I Mel, okay. Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, Oof. and that that movie has absolutely no score. 
yeah at That's... all it has a couple i think source pieces of music in it but there's yeah. no score the entire time it's just so dry and yeah. in contrast like that does something else i mean it really makes it feel real it, yeah. you know because music can break the fourth wall in a lot of ways it yeah. sort of reminds us that we're watching a movie it's like if we're watching a horror movie sometimes when the scary music comes in it's scary but it's also like no it's just a movie yeah. there was like no score in that film yeah and it was just so gritty and just like man what's what's gonna happen you know mm -hmm. it, it it creates tension in another way when you don't have music yeah mm -hmm. that's that's true the uh, uh, oh, we, we do have uh, a couple fans chiming in here. So hey uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, this is G. Larry Brown. He's he's a, a film actor here. Um, he was in um, what was it? <laughs> HBO's uh, um, winning is it winning season? No, winning time. The basketball uh, series with uh, oh um, yes, uh, John C. Riley. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm butchering names now, but um but uh yeah he's <laughs> yeah he's 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 a lot of fun and then cool. uh, we've got uh ella strange um yeah yeah basically uh you, you guys are in, uh very interesting and inspirational you know talking about you know music um but he's suggesting that uh you uh announce uh screwdriver at gofo and uh send out a link you know when it's online cool <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah but uh, yeah, you wanted to join in too on you know the background noise, uh, oh. perfect sound. You know, you know, mm -hmm. you know what they consider is you know white noise. Um, yeah, is is that an option that you utilize? I guess some of that white noise can also be tone too. Yeah, I mean, there's always the. I mean, I always think of some of the sound composition is coming from the editing and from like fully. Right. Um, I think that I worked pretty. I worked with the person doing Foley on the last doc because there were points where I could like, you know, mix my sound into it or come out because everything has a pitch, right? Or it has yeah. a texture and it's easy to emulate. So if you're like opening a door, well, maybe that creak of the sound can be the sound of a cello. You know, it's a nice transitional right. material. Um, that's kind of what I found. I don't know about you. How about you, Sean? Yeah, I mean, that's so awesome. If you get the opportunity to work with the sound design person like yeah. that, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if I have ever had that opportunity i mean on, there was one film that i did where i got to be in the mix oh. and for for like a week which is also somewhat unusual for the composer to get to be a part of that mix mm -hmm. you know but but i haven't i don't think i've had the opportunity to do that like when i was composing the music but mm -hmm. every time that i'm working on a film um i always am thinking like gosh that would be great because right. it, it's strange how those those processes are really tend to be separated um it's weird to for, me for filmmakers every time i'm going man these things should we should be doing right. this together right. but generally i think what i have found in my experience is that you don't get any of the sound design because they're doing it at the same time so you yeah. just have temp sound or you you just have scratch sound you know mm -hmm. and and you're really having to imagine yeah. um I, I've worked on this television series, uh, Das Boot, Das Boat, oh, okay. um, uh, for a, well, since the series started. Um, I work with the composer, Matthias Weber. Uh, but that show, the reason I bring that up is because that show is so sound effect heavy. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a World War II action series. A lot of it, there's a lot of like, you know, stuff on the submarine and there's, there's you know, action sequences with torpedoes and this and that and airplanes and um and you really have to just like that was something i had to sort of learn was yeah. they're gonna there's gonna be sound effect here just from just from seeing what's on the screen to have to go okay yeah. this is the spot where there's gonna the sound effect's gonna be really really loud you know mm -hmm. so i need to anticipate that that's gonna be there even though it's not there yet and compose something that's gonna not compete with it mm -hmm. but is gonna live with it right yeah, yeah. It, there's an action scene where it's they got a huge Gatling gun, you know, and it's ja, 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 ja. maybe I don't want to go ja, 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 with my drum yeah. because they're going to yeah. be living in the exact same place, yeah. you know. Right. Right. Do something. But it's cool though because I think from that, like what I found with my last talk is like those were things where I could take like themes, like a rhythm, because there's a rhythm in that, right? And I remember just writing the opening of this doc, and I had heard in the first pass of everything like these seagull cries and so i just 
copied those and then I requested that they overlay it with each other. Um, mm. But I think I'm guessing that I'm lucky on this one. That's, that's <laughs> cool. I love this kind of stuff because I feel like I'm getting ideas and I'm learning from you. That's a really cool idea to just like listen to the sound that's in there and Right, hear it as music and kind of yeah. come up with your ideas based on that. But don't you feel like that's what I mean? For me, that's kind of the beauty of having gone to school for it for a little bit, because in some ways you're able to transcribe that, or you're able to. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You might be thinking about it a bit more because that is a compositional practice. Yeah. So, since you know, like Vivaldi did it in the Four Seasons with like echoing bird calls, and mm -hmm. it's a thing. Yeah, that's yeah. super cool. That's I feel like. I tend to find myself gravitating towards like emo the emotion. Like yeah. I'm not like listening yeah. as much, but I, I love this because oh I feel like it's a cool idea. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like I tend to, to write more from just trying to take in like what the feeling is and kind of yeah. seeing what, what comes out based. I like that too, that. though. I think I'm kind of in both spaces at the moment as I do more of this and finding my own process. But a lot of it's just sitting with the film and almost like watching it and watching it and watching it until, and then I'll go to the cello mm -hmm. and something will come out. But I record everything. I, I'm like so into the first time that I watch the film. Oh, For me, oh, yeah. it's like super important. I'm always like, I always tell the oh. directors, whoever that I work with, like, yeah, I want to watch it, but like, like give me a, a minute. Like, I just, I want to make sure that I have all my tools in front of me. Cause mm -hmm. like that first initial reaction, the stuff that comes out, you know, yeah. so often there are things in there that end up like being, huh, you know, that's and, so cool. making it in. I'm like, I just want that like knee jerk response. Um, yeah. I always try to discount my knee jerk because I find really? that in the end, I, it's just because it's my own process, but yeah. like, um, I'm too, I'm taking in too much and I'm kind of outputting garbage. Uh -huh. So the more I filter, yeah. the more I'll get, and very often I'll end up at the beginning again, but I do yeah. have to have that repetition of just inhabiting the space for a long time. Yeah. Um, which makes me a really slow composer, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm more like in the ideal world, you know, we have. Like I've been working on this podcast that is actually just finishing for like a year scoring this this podcast wow, and cool. that was lug luxurious because mm -hmm. there was basically like a year from the time that I got the scripts until I think I think until the first one launched or almost that so I just had tons of time to come up with uh, so many ideas ah, that's great and there are times when I'm like sometimes in that process I'm like this is so nice I get to come up with 50 ideas and figure out the best ones you know yeah. and then there are times where I'm like oh man I wish I didn't have this much time because now I've got 50 ideas, you know? Yeah. I uh, wish I had like, you yeah. know, a month and then I just had to like go with my gut. <laughs> yeah. But I think you end up going with your gut either oh, way. Yeah. Just right. you end up there a, di a different way. I was wondering though in your process or what you found, have you, I mean, you must have had times when your vision was at odds with the director. And like for me, like when I have that stuff, I, I think I've been working so long. It's very easy for me to like, it's okay. <laughs> right. But I mean, there's still a part of me that's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Kind of have to drown that baby, so to speak. It's like, yeah. ah, you know, you, you want to hang on to it and see it through. But yeah. You know, sometimes it ends up being, it's it's somebody else's vision, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And yeah, it's, I feel like the integrity of the project and the vision is what matters, not my feelings. Absolutely. You know? I 100% I agree with that. You know, right. we're, we're in service to the story. Exactly. You know, right. ev everyone on the crew is. Yeah. I feel, I don't know. I feel lucky. I feel like I haven't had that kind of a situation where like my creative vision was at odds with the cr director's creative vision, <laughs> like Project fundamentally. Director. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't be drawn to you in the first place. I think there's the vision mm -hmm. is the overriding. Yeah. But I, yeah. But I think that it, I, f I guess I say that I'm lucky because I feel like I feel like that's going to happen at some point in your career. And, you know, you know, it might yes. mean that you end up leaving a project or or whatever. But I guess, right. yeah, I'm fortunate I haven't. Of course, there are times in any project where oh, I think maybe you should do this. No, I wanted to do that. And and I I think I like to just practice like letting go because yeah. ultimately like I find that the places that I'm drawn because of where the director wanted me to go or wanted me to try oh, le yeah. leads me to some cool thing that I go, you know what, this is really cool. Like I wouldn't have. So 
it's mm -hmm. it's yeah i like to there are of course times where i'm going oh man i really i don't know but i'm right. gonna try it because you know i've had yeah. enough experience to well see you, you guys yeah. can always like look at uh working towards uh you know some some other goal too where not only uh are you composing the music but you're also the director like carpenter you know uh you know somebody like john carpenter who composes his own music and you know from that you get you know you get the the really um you know uh um identifiable you know halloween you know you know music that uh, that that pops up just before mike myers or michael myers you know is on screen or um you know like even uh suspiria from dario yeah. argento You've got the band Goblin who that did uh, you know the music for that, and now even even fifty year almost fifty years later, mm -hmm. um, you know they're they're the the band is touring around playing the live music, you know, uh, sometimes even to the film. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, yeah. I guess I recently you know I released Pariah, which was my operetta, but it was it has a film accompaniment that I had directed. Right. And it does feel really cool to compose to my own film, you know, like, yeah. because in some ways that visual stuff is my guiding force. I've always been a kind of oddball musician in that I'm very visually informed mm -hmm. and I always yeah. think of visuals as a prompt and a jumping off point. So do you feel like that at all, Sean? Because you went to film school. So even though you transitioned from film to music, there must be some visual element that feels good for you, right? Yeah, you know, I, I think like I always, even when I was doing solo music for a long time, mm -hmm. it was always I, I always was imagining a story to to, right. to music. Like the albums that I've made almost always have some sort of like a thread of, of a story in them. Even if I don't like say it explicitly in anything on the album, normally I don't because I really like ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um I, I'm, I yeah i like playing with ambiguity a lot but so i think it makes a lot of sense that i'm you know i'm drawn to film music because yeah. it's about this story it's like yeah it's in service to that that story yeah definitely because like your your album orcas right um which you put out for your your master's recital right yeah yeah that i that was an album i started recording in denver and uh, when I went back to school, uh, continued to work on it. And then when I was, yeah, when I was in the program, uh, when I was graduating, I decided to do a live version of it. So, um, nice. uh, yeah, with a string ensemble and uh, oh, the pandemic kind of messed up my plans for that album. That's the music that I was playing with Ch Chalista was that is the yeah. live live performance of that album. Um, the album never came out. It will just sitting here on the shelf, and uh, I'm not quite sure what to do with it yet. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's talking to you right now. Say, <laughs> please release me. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll happen when it needs to happen. But uh, it was a beautiful so. album that had projections, and it and Sean's master's recital was so so theatrical and so it pulled at my heartstrings because everything i've done has been more theater based and i was like there's mm -hmm. someone else out there <laughs> <laughs> but sean had you know lighting lighting that mattered lighting that had cues that was responsive to the flow of the music he had projections that were responsive to his music like everything gelled and it's just unusual to find that kind of I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, that I that that stuff is really important to me in live performance, and I think a little bit goes a long way. Um, I I started playing with projections behind me. Um, oh man, I don't know. I guess it was like four or five years, maybe before that show. But when I was touring, I started touring with a yeah. a screen and a projector that I would that I would put up behind me, and I had specific visuals for each song. Yeah. And and like it's a lot of more kind of abstract, but. But it, but maybe had enough information just to give like a hint of maybe what what it's about or where it's going. Right. And it's for, cool because yeah. you trust your audience to tell their own story within your world. Yes, and I think that's the takeaway when they walk out of your concerts. I, yeah. I think that's so important to leave room for that. Like, which is why I, I keep saying ambiguity because I think ambiguity, like just like you're saying, it leaves room for people to create 
you mm-hmm. know what a meaning for yeah. Yeah. They can, yeah, that's origin. <laughs> yeah, they can insert their own story. They can project their own, you know, uh, you know, uh, personal stories, or, or even yeah. like something like their insecurities or, or something. And, yeah, you know, it can be a, a great coping tool. Totally, a lot of that. Um, actually, uh, our our old drummer from uh, my old group uh, OFM just uh, chimed in. Um, he uh, he said that he's heard of uh, you know stock footage. Is is that is there the same for uh, you know music? It, you know, would it would it be like uh, some of the you know placeholder music or um, some of the yeah. stuff that you guys were mentioning? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of you know, like I guess you can call it stock music, but like people have mm-hmm. libraries you can license music from. Right. Sean probably has more experience with this. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't have that as much experience creating that music but yeah there's a thing called library music um, right that is sort of this whole other world that um it's more of, like in the world of music supervisors are operating there i would yeah, say no yeah well 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 the people who write it uh there are a lot yeah. of composers who sort of specialize in library music it's an interesting right. thing because it's kind of the opposite process where like for film music you've got the visual and you're composing to that for yeah. with yeah. library music you're composing music that will go to many different kinds of picture later right. so yeah that's like what i do very often for a library and they place it yes so like real murders of orange county but that's right. right. like it placed in like my thousand pound sister right or, don't <laughs> you don't really have control over it if it's not your library although i'm currently working on building up my own to license out yeah nice so that's kind of like there are these companies that that do that i think there's yeah. also like th- there's also things like um uh, music bed is another company where um, it's a place where you can buy licenses of yeah. pre-existing music. Um, I don't know that it, like I, from what I know of library music, it has more, has, a lot of times it has this sort of like a format, right? That it, that it has like do a with a build and do a B section with a build. Or do yeah. Something. I think it kind of depends on the library too, but that, I mean, that's, I mean, I do some of that, but that's not totally my world either. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. That's that. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting to hear. We uh, we're just about out of time, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I've just got one more uh, quick question. Um, what's you guys' next project? Uh, do you have another film in the works? I know, uh, you know, uh, Chilista, you've got uh, a, a new um, uh, documentary short that uh, that you, you've uh, composed music for. And um, yeah. yeah. I'm currently at work on a theater piece called Elegy. That's based on the little match girl. So it's set for cello and loop station, silent film. And then I'm performing on static trapeze. Oh, with wow. the idea being that the static trapeze acts as this perfect kind of prop. It can be, you wow. could look at it like it's a window or wow. a door or something you step through or fall yeah. through or go around a rope. So that's my main prop for this theater piece. And that's supposed cool. to happen in about one year. Because I'm cool. trained, I have to train for this, which is yeah, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Oh, that's amazing, Sean. How about you? Uh, yeah. So the this podcast, um, the the oh, what is today? I don't have my watch on. What is today? It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. So the last episode of this podcast, the podcast is called "The Madness of Chartrulian. um, and it's on anywhere you get podcasts. It's like it's like a full cast audio drama, um. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of a sci-fi drama sort of Game of Thronesy thing. Anyway, I've been working on that for about a year. The last episode of that is coming out now, um, so that's been a big project. Hopefully, that is there. I think there's going to be another season of that. Maybe we'll see. I don't yes. know. Um, but uh, but yeah, you can listen to that now. Um, I also got. I was really lucky to get to work with another composer, uh, Brian McComber, who's done a couple uh, horror films that I really. Nice. love uh from a24 um i got to work with him and do compose some additional music and do string arrangements on a feature film called fair play that we just found out is uh premiering at sundance this year which oh, is super cool congrats. that's awesome yeah. yeah thanks i was i'm really grateful to him for inviting me to to help help him out with that um so yeah that's screening there in january um yeah, that's kind of the two big things in my world right now. 
My God, that's that's awesome. Yeah, you guys are you know just making amazing works. Uh, yeah, Chalista, yeah, performing, you know, doing trapeze. Good God. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing anything anywhere near that impressive. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if I get there. I'm no. sitting on a yoga ball. That's about as <laughs> I think that we need to do a show before your your second baby <laughs> happens and you disappear. Not, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I really need to pack in a lot of things before. You got till May, so oh, make till it happen. May, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I recently scored a documentary film for Field of Vision, which is a distribution company. And the film is called Sickness in the System. It's based on prisoners in San Quentin who contracted COVID. Oh, wow. Um, and so that's been doing a very quiet run. Um, we are we are submitting for an Oscar. So Whoa. wish us luck. We just need, you know, we need to push it and whatnot. But it's a beautiful right. film. Cool. And um, I'm hoping to bring it to Boulder this year at the Dairy Center. And I'm going to try to live score it. Cool. Yeah. That'd that's, be amazing. That's fantastic. Wow. That's so cool. Uh, for everybody that's uh, out there watching this, make sure to uh, go to their websites. Uh, you know, go to seanrenner.com uh, and chalista.net uh, to, to look at uh, all the you know, amazing bodies of work and, uh, you know, you know, make sure to follow them on social media as well. And, uh, you know, just continue, uh, you know, supporting, amazing musicians doing uh, amazing uh you know things and uh enriching our lives god damn it <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah sean chalisa it's it so good having you uh on here and and chatting a little bit more about uh the you know the music process but behind film uh you know hope i i know i got a, a nice education uh and i'm sure everybody else that tuned in also uh did as well <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having me. me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, so stick around while we, we uh, sign off. But uh, yeah, again, thanks for being so generous with your time and coming on for our last show of the year. Yeah. You know? So we did happy it. holidays, everybody. Happy uh, holidays. A new kid coming on the way. And, uh, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Good luck with the sleepless nights, right? Ah, uh, thank you. I've had a little bit of practice, so I'm training. Okay, okay. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. All right, uh, and of course, uh, you know, thanks to our sponsors, to Mutiny Information Cafe. If you're going to start a revolution, make sure you're caffeinated. And our friends at Hellfire Entertainment, thanks for rebroadcasting us on your social media. Uh, Groovy TV, and of course our friends at uh, Alien Donut Films, to Bill and Angel over there, and my producers, uh, Stefan Santa Cruz and Amanda Armstrong, and uh, to everybody that tuned in, have a good, safe, happy holidays, you know, Merry Christmas, and all that great nonsense, and uh, we'll, we'll see you, uh, I think we're returning uh, next year on the 11th with... Uh, actor uh, Heath Haynes, who's been in uh, Bored as Hell, play, uh, playing Satan. So that's always fun, nice. you know? Uh, but uh, yeah, everybody out there, thanks so much for tuning in. Be good, be kind, help each other out during yeah. these tough times. Stay spooky and uh, happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs>